Welcome to 2023 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. This week's recording of the Sabbath School lesson is from the series titled Managing for the Master Till He Comes. It's authored by Biblical scholar G. Edward Reed, Master of Divinity, Master of Public Health, and also who has a law degree. He's an ordained minister and licensed attorney who served for many years as the Director of Stewardship Ministries of the North American Division. The lesson is read by Dr. Percy Harold as a free service with his niece Sibylla volunteering the mission story. Lesson 1, ready for teaching on January 6, is titled, Part of God's Family, Sabbath afternoon, December 31. Our memory text this week is 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we open your word this quarter, as we look at your responsibility to us and our responsibility to you and the grace which you supply so freely, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us through every word of the Scripture. And as we read these lessons, as we listen, we pray that not only will we learn more about you, but that our lives may be changed so that we may be better able to serve you and also that in our own personal lives we can be a light to those around us. Bless us today, whether we live in Anguilla or uh, Antigua or Barbados or Australia. And in Australia, I'd like to mention those who could be listening in Inala or in Babinda. Those in the Bahamas, those in Bangladesh, Barbados, Belize, Bermuda, Botswana, Brunei, Cameroon, Canada, Cayman Islands and the Cook Islands out in the middle of the Pacific. Lord, wherever we're listening, we pray that you'll be with us and bless us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text we've already read was 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. As Christians, an amazing feature about our relationship with God is that He trusts us to manage His affairs on the earth. At the very outset of human history, God explicitly delegated to Adam and Eve the personal care of a flawless creation, as you read in Genesis 2, 7-9. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And verse 15, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. From the naming of the animals to keeping the garden and to filling the earth with children, God let it be known that we are to work on his behalf here. He also blesses us with resources, but we are the ones whom he has entrusted to manage them, such as to collect money, to write the checks, to do the electronic transfers, to make the budgets, or to bring our tithes and offerings to the church on Sabbath mornings. God encourages us to spend the resources that he has given to us for our own needs, for the needs of others, and for the advancement of his work. Incredible as it may seem, we are the ones whom God has entrusted with raising his children, building his buildings, and educating the succeeding generations. In this week's study, we will explore the privileges and responsibilities of being a part of the family of God. And now for the two-page introduction to this series of lessons, written by G. Edward Reed and read by Dr. Percy Harold. G. Edward Reed has a Master of Divinity from Andrews University, Master of Public Health from Loma Linda University, and a JD from Georgia State University. He is an ordained minister and licensed attorney who served for many years as the Director of Stewardship Ministries for the North American Division. The title is 
managing for the Master until he comes. It is difficult for us to comprehend fully the relationship that our God, the Creator of the universe, wants to have with us human beings. The mere idea of it is astounding. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. Or, as Ellen G. White wrote, Can any human dignity equal this? What higher position can we occupy than to be called the sons of the infinite God? Can any worldly honour equal this? That's from God's Amazing Grace, page 341. It's only the darkness of this sin-laden world that causes us not to appreciate fully the status that we have been given in Jesus. Yet, if we are not careful, the lure of the world and the things of the world will pull us away from Christ. The Word of God informs us of the temptations and allurements of Satan. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, we read, and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. The Lord, however, gives us guidance on how to earn money and utilise it wisely and not let it be something that, as Paul warned, can lead to destruction and perdition. In the more than 2,000 verses in the Scriptures that deal with money and possessions and our attitude toward them, God gives practical instruction on how to live above the stresses of life and to manage in financially faithful ways what we have been given. In this quarter's lessons, we will study God's ideal in our relationship with Him and clearly see how we can develop a trust so deep that we will remain faithful to Him even when we can't buy or sell, as it says in Revelation 13 verse 17. But this kind of faith does not come overnight. By faithfully managing what God has given us, we can be prepared, even now, for whatever comes our way. God is the one with the resources, and when we work with Him, He allows us to handle them for Him. It is the Saviour's purpose that human beings, purified and sanctified, shall be His helping hand. For this great privilege, let us give thanks to Him who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, as we read in Colossians 1, 13 and 14. God's counsel to his children through the wise man Solomon is, in Proverbs 3 verse 9, Honour the Lord with your possessions and with the firstfruits of all your increase. This counsel is appropriate because you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Revelation 4 verse 11 from a merely secular perspective, we live in very challenging and stressful times. However, our Christian worldview gives us confidence and hope as we see the signs Jesus gave to let us know that the great climax of human history, the second coming of Christ, is very near, even at the door. We pray that these practical lessons will deepen your faith and trust in God and encourage you to be a faithful manager for him. And here is a disclaimer. Contents of these lessons are not intended to be financial advice, but is general commentary based on biblical principles. The reader is encouraged to seek competent professional advice which will suit their particular personal situation. Sunday, January 1. Welcome to 2023. We are part of God's family. 
For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, we read in Ephesians 3, verses 14 and 15. What imagery is evoked in this verse, and what hope is found there? Let's read it again. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Early in Jesus' ministry, he stated in Matthew 6, 9, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Later, he repeats the same prayer privately with his disciples in Luke 11, verse 2. So he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus told us to call his Father, our Father in heaven. When Jesus encountered Mary after his resurrection, she wanted to embrace him. John 20 verse 17 says, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Because we have the same Father as Jesus, He is our brother, and we are all brothers and sisters in the Lord. Jesus became a member of the earthly family, so that we could become members of the heavenly family. In the Desire of Ages, page 832, we read this gem, The family of heaven and the family of earth are one. Read Exodus chapter 3, verse 10, Exodus 5, 1, and Galatians 3, verses 26 and 29. What do these verses say about how God relates to us? Why should this be so encouraging? Exodus chapter 3 and verse 10. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Exodus 5, verse 1, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Galatians 3, verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And Galatians 3.29 And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In contrast to a view of creation in which we are deemed the mere products of cold, uncaring natural laws, Scripture teaches not only that God exists, but also that He loves us and relates to us in such a loving manner that the imagery of family is often used in Scripture to depict that relationship. Whether Jesus calls Israel my people, or us sons of God, or refers to God as our Father, the point is still the same. God loves us the way family members are supposed to love each other. What good news amid a world that, in and of itself, can be very hostile. And so to finish today, imagine a world in which we treated everyone as family. How can we learn to relate better to all human beings as our brothers and sisters? Monday, January 2. God is the owner of everything. Read Psalm 50, verses 10 to 12, Psalm 24, 1, 1 Chronicles 29, 13 and 14, and Haggai 2, verse 8. What's the message here? And what should this truth mean to us and how we relate to whatever we possess? First of all, Psalm 50, verses 10 to 12. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. 
If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all its fullness. And Psalm 24 verse 1, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. And First Chronicles 29 beginning at verse 13, Now therefore our God we thank you and praise your glorious name. But... Who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this for all things come from you and of your own we have given you. And Haggai chapter 2 verse 8 The silver is mine and the gold is mine says the Lord of hosts. The book of First Chronicles starting with chapter 17 records King David's desire to build a house for God. He shared his desire with the prophet Nathan, who responded, Do all that is in your heart, for God is with you, in 1 Chronicles 17 verse 2. But that night the word of God came to Nathan and instructed him to tell the king that, because he was a man of war, he couldn't build God's house. His son would do the work instead. David asked if he could at least draw the plans and prepare the building materials. When David was granted this request, he spent the rest of his life amassing a tremendous amount of hewn stone, cedar, iron, gold, silver and brass without measure. When all of the building materials had been prepared and assembled at the building site, David called all the leaders of Israel together for a ceremony of praise and thanksgiving. In 1 Chronicles 29 verses 13 and 14, which we've just read, in King David's public prayer, who did he say was the real source of all the building materials that he and the people had spent time and money preparing? Of course, in essence, he said, We really can't take any credit for all these special materials because we are just giving you back your own stuff. The point is important for all of us, whether rich or poor, but especially the rich, because God made everything in the beginning, as we read in Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, And also in John chapter 1 and verse 3, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And in Psalm 33 verse 6, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And verse 9, For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. He is truly the rightful owner of all that exists, including whatever we possess, no matter how hard and diligently and honestly we have worked for it. If not for God and His grace, we would have nothing, we would be nothing, in fact, we wouldn't even exist. Thus, we must always live with the realisation that ultimately God owns all that is and by praising and thanking him for his goodness to us, we can keep this important truth before us. And so to finish today, 1 Chronicles 29.14 reads, But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? What beautiful principles are expressed in these words? And how do they reflect what our attitude to God should be and our attitude to what we possess? Tuesday, January 3. Resources available for God's family. God's greatest gift to his children is Jesus Christ, who brings us the peace of forgiveness, grace for daily living and spiritual growth, and the hope of eternal life. For God so loved the world, we read in John 3.16, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
And in John 1 verse 12 we read, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Salvation, then, is the foundational gift, because without this gift, what else could we get from God that in the long term would really matter? Whatever we might have here, one day we will be dead and gone, and so will everyone who ever remembered us, and whatever good we did will be forgotten as well. First and foremost, then, we must always keep the gift of the gospel, that is, Christ and him crucified, at the centre of all our thoughts. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And yet, along with salvation, God gives us so much more. To those who were concerned about their food and clothing, Jesus offered comfort by saying in Matthew 6.33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Read Psalm 23 verse 1 and Psalm 37.25 and Philippians 4 verse 19. What do these verses say about God's provision for our daily needs? Psalm 23, verse 1 The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And Psalm 37, verse 25 I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. And Philippians chapter 4 Verse 19, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Also, when Jesus talked to his disciples about going away, he promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to comfort them. In John chapter 14, verses 15 to 17, he said, If ye love me, Keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. And then in John 16 verse 13 he said, He will guide you into all truth. Then the Spirit himself gives amazing spiritual gifts to God's children, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 11. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. In short, the God in whom we live and move and have our being, as it says in Acts 17.28, the God who gives to all life, breath and all things, as it says in Acts 17.25, has given us existence, the promise of salvation, material blessings and spiritual gifts in order to be a blessing to others. Again, whatever material possessions that we have, whatever gifts or talents we have been blessed with, we are indebted in every way to the giver in how we use those gifts.
Wednesday, January 4. Responsibilities of God's Family Members We all enjoy the spiritual and temporal blessings and gifts that God gives us. How comforting to know, too, that we are part of the family. Read Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5 and Matthew 22:37. What does this mean and how do we do it? Deuteronomy 6 verse 5 You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. How would you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind? Interestingly enough, The Bible gives us the answer, and it's not what most people expect. Read Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13, and 1 John 5, verse 3. Biblically speaking, what is our proper response in our love relationship with our Father in heaven? Deuteronomy 10, beginning at verse 12, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But, to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. And 1 John 5, verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Keeping the law, obeying the commandments... For many Christians, unfortunately, the idea of obeying the law, especially the fourth commandment, is legalism. And they claim that we are called simply to love God and to love our neighbour as ourselves. However, God is clear. We reveal our love to God and to our neighbours by, yes, obeying his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. 1 John 5.3 We are used to looking at this verse as, well, we love God and therefore we keep his commandments. That's fine, but perhaps we also can read it as, this is the love of God. That is, we know and experience the love of God by keeping his commandments. In Matthew 7, 21 to 27, Jesus said that those who hear and do God's words are likened to a wise builder who built his house upon the solid rock. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Those who hear but don't obey are likened to a foolish builder who built his house on the sand with disastrous results. Both heard the word, one obeyed, one didn't. The result made the difference between life and death. And so to finish today, think about the link between loving God and obeying his law. Why would love for God be expressed in that way? What is it about keeping the commandments that indeed does reveal that love? Here's a hint. Think about what disobeying his law causes.
Thursday, January 5, Treasure in Heaven. Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21 reads, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What crucial truths is Jesus speaking here? Who hasn't read story after story of those who had amassed great wealth, only somehow to lose it? Our world is a very unstable place. Wars, crime, violence, natural disasters, anything can come in a moment and take away all that we have worked for and, perhaps, even what we have honestly and faithfully earned. Then, too, in a moment, death comes, and so these things become useless to us anyway. Of course, Scripture never tells us it's wrong to be rich or to have amassed wealth. Instead, in these verses, Jesus warns us to keep it all in perspective. What, though, does it mean to lay up treasure in heaven? It means making God and His cause first and foremost in your life, instead of making money first and foremost. Among other things, it means using what we have for the work of God, for the advancement of His kingdom, for working in behalf of others, and for being a blessing to others. For instance, when God called Abram, He planned to use Abram and his family to bless all the families of the earth. God said to Abram, who was called the friend of God in James 2.23, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. And in Galatians 3.9, So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. We have the same challenge presented to us as was presented to him. And as we read in Christ's Object Lessons, page 351, Money has great value because it can do great, great good. In the hands of God's children, it is food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, and clothing for the naked. It is a defence for the oppressed and a means of help to the sick. But money is of no more value than sand only as it is put to use in providing for the necessities of life, in blessing others and advancing the cause of Christ. End of quote. And so to finish today from Matthew 6.21 we read, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where does your heart tell you your treasure is? Friday, January 6. From the book Steps to Christ, page 21, we read, The heart of God yearns over his earthly children with a love stronger than death. In giving up his Son, he has poured out to us all heaven in one gift. The Saviour's life and death and intercession, the ministry of angels, the pleading of the Spirit, the Father working above and through all, the unceasing interest of heavenly beings, all are enlisted in behalf of man's redemption. And then from Thoughts for the Amount of Blessing, page 110, if you have renounced self and given yourself to Christ, you are a member of the family of God and everything in the Father's house is for you. All the treasures of God are open to you, both the world that now is and that which is to come. The ministry of angels, the gift of his spirit, the labours of his servants are all for you. The world, with everything in it, is yours so far as it can do you good. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. With all of these awesome gifts that God gives his children, we are compelled to ask, as did the psalmist, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me, 
That's Psalm 116, verse 12. Make a list of the blessings and gifts of God to you in your spiritual and temporal life and be ready to share it with your class. What does this teach you about how thankful to God you really should be? 2. Though we think about God, and rightly so, as our Creator, Scripture again and again teaches that He is our Sustainer as well, as we read in Hebrews 1 and verse 3, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. And Job chapter 38 verses 33 to 37. Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you set their dominion over the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send out lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the mind? Or who has given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Or who can pour out the bottles of heaven? And Psalm 135, verses 6 and 7. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deep places. He causes the vapours to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. And Colossians 1, verse 17, And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And Acts chapter 17, verse 28, For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. And Second Peter chapter 3, verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. From the galaxies in the cosmos to the beating of our hearts, to the forces that hold together the atomic structures that make up all known matter, it is only God's sustaining power that keeps them in existence. How should this biblical truth help us understand just what our obligations are to God in terms of how we use whatever He has given us? How does this reality help us keep our life and the purpose of our life in proper perspective? 3. The lesson talked about why, of all God has given us, Jesus and the plan of salvation are the greatest gifts. Why is that true? What would we have if we didn't have that and the great hope it offers us? An atheist writer depicted humans as nothing but hunks of spoiling flesh on disintegrating bones. Why, without the gift of the gospel, would he have a point? It's time for our mission story for this week, read by my niece Sibylla, who, like me, is also a volunteer. Thank you, Sibylla. Mission Field in Lake Malawi by A.D.V. Moyo A stranger stopped the Seventh-day Adventist University student as he walked down the road after a Pathfinder meeting on the island of Chizumulu in Lake Malawi. His green Pathfinder uniform caught her attention. Where are you coming from? the stranger asked with great interest. The student, Levison Kawonga, told her that he had been participating in a Pathfinder event at an Adventist church. His words seemed to touch her heart, and the words started rolling off her lips. I used to be an Adventist, she said. I married an Adventist man, but we divorced. She spoke about going to bars and living licentiously after the divorce. Then she moved to Chizumulu and married a local high school teacher. The next Sabbath, the woman showed up at the Adventist church. She enjoyed the worship service and she asked Levison for Bible studies. Levison was delighted. 
This was why he had come to the island in the first place, to share God's love. He belonged to a club of Adventist students at Muzuzu University, a major public university of 8,500 students, located about 60 miles or 100 kilometers away. The club aimed to strengthen the faith of Adventist students, and each one reached out to classmates through twice-weekly prayer meetings. The club grew into the Mizuzu Seventh-day Adventist Church, and its students fanned out to engage in missionary work in places in the region, including Chizumulu. Levison visited the woman and her husband in their home, and after the Bible study left behind several books, including Ellen White's The Great Controversy. When Levison arrived for the second Bible study, he found the husband deeply engrossed in The Great Controversy. What's the difference between Saturday and Sunday? the husband asked Levison. At the end of the Bible study, he promised to go with his wife to church the next Sabbath. Weeks and months passed and the man and his wife gave their hearts to Jesus and were baptised. Today, they are mission-minded members of the Chisamulu Seventh-day Adventist Church. Levison is convicted that God can use young people to reach anyone and everyone. It is time to go and reach different classes of people with the good news of Jesus Christ, he said. The Mizuni Seventh-day Adventist Church, which started as a club of students, never dreamed that the Chizumulu effort would bear such fruit. Glory to God. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.